Hey, welcome back to the Marvelous Old World Podcast. My name is Matthew Smith. We are going to do a deep dive into Seattle's architectural history and looking at the last half of the 18th century, primarily into the 19th century. Uh, the more I look at this history of Seattle, the stranger things get. I'm excited to share this with you. I might have to break it into two parts because I've collated uh, over 100 photos and images. It's taken me several weeks now of research, so it might get a little long. I do ask that if you can stick with it, and uh, there's going to be a lot revealed throughout throughout this uh, podcast. So if you have the uh, stamina and the will to uh, learn more than you might have ever known about Seattle's uh, strange past, stick with this podcast to the end. Now, in in order to kind of set a baseline by research, I'm not talking about going through you know Wikipedia articles, although I did poke around there, but primarily I cleaned out Seattle, the Seattle library system and the King County library system. I looked at countless uh, historical websites. So this is really uh, the basis for my research was actually uh, looking into historical uh, books about this city. Of all of the books, this book called Distant Corner by Jeffrey Oxner uh, and Dennis Anderson really stood out for me because, uh, well, Jeffrey Oxner is a professor of architecture and architectural history at the University of Washington. He's been there since 1988. Um, this book, I believe, was released in the early 2000s, and it frames the uh, the legacy of Seattle, early Seattle architecture in the context of uh, one of the three pillars of American architecture, H.H. H. Richard, Richardson, who is credited with the uh, architectural, what they call an architectural style, Richardsonian Romanesque or Romanesque revival in America. Buildings such as uh, Trinity Church in Boston, if you want to look that one up, it's a breathtaking uh, masterpiece of architecture. And, you know, I believe uh, what I'm going to do is a separate podcast on this book itself because there's so much to it. And uh, also looking into the uh, legacy of H.H. H. Richardson himself, because the more I look at who he is, or who, who he was, and the stock of buildings that are attributed to him, uh, the more questions I have. For instance, there's there's a huge discrepancy uh, between the, the masterful architectural uh, work, really a genius level work of something like Trinity Church in Boston versus some of the houses that he is said to have designed, which are, I don't know, they look kind of amateurish to me. So so that's, so I'm going to dive deeper into that, but I wanted to start out this podcast with reading from the preface of uh, Distant Corner, and it's really going to kind of frame the lens uh, through which we are going to explore Seattle's architectural legacy. So it begins, architects arrived from outside the Northwest, and within a few months were able to win significant commissions, but their success was often fleeting, and some who were leaders in 89, 1889 and 1890 saw their practices dissolved by 1892. Um, I'm going to pause right there. 1889 is a pivotal year in Seattle. It's the year of the Great Fire. It's also the year of the Great Fire in uh, Ellensburg and Spokane, two very important cities in Washington state, and also happens to be the year that Washington became a state. So I find that curious, and it's something that we're going to be looking into uh, much more deeply as we proceed. So architects arrived uh, ostensibly to uh, pitch in with the rebuilding of the city after the Great Fire uh, that struck the downtown, but their practices were already dissolving by 1892. And I'm going to ask again for um, you, the listening audience, to really pay attention to the dates, because what I want to do is, is take a sort of a forensics approach to this study and look at how the the dates of the official historical narrative overlap and, and sometimes conflict with uh, what we see in terms of the actual 
building stock that is uh, evident from buildings that still exist, but also from the photographic record. And so the more I look at that, the more, question, the more questions emerge about what is the actual uh, true uh, history of this city. Uh, so it continues, uh, the severity of the economic collapse after 1893, and there was a, a major economic collapse and depression in 1893, uh, all over the country, uh, forced over two thirds of the architects who had been in practice in Seattle in the early 1890s to depart by 1896. Okay, so they had a few good years there, but it didn't last too long. This high degree of transience means that primary source materials for these architects and their practices are scarce or non-existent. Few documents survive from Seattle architects' practices of the pre-1900 era. So that's curious. Uh, and again, this is being written by a professor of architecture who for more than you know, four decades has been teaching at the University of Washington. So I would say, uh, you know, this is as good a credentialed uh, source as, as you can find. While the most important evidence of these architects and their intentions remains the buildings themselves and the photographic record of buildings that have disappeared, these alone are insufficient to create a complete picture of the period. Even the simple problem of attribution can be difficult. In this regard, we have depended to a large extent on contemporary publications to identify individual buildings and their architects. These publications include professional journals and local and regional periodicals and trade publications, but, but for the pre-1900 period, the primary source for Seattle architecture is, what do you think? Newspaper accounts. <laughs> Uh, we, we will continue. Fortunately, in the period before and after 1889 uh, Seattle Fire, architects and their buildings were, were news, particularly because the buildings were physical evidence of the cities overcoming that calamity, and so were the frequent subjects of published reports. Such reports offer the added benefit of providing a sense of how the buildings were regarded at the time, but we have also had to recognize the limitations of local reporting with its hidden biases and frequent self-serving boosterism. Beyond the, difficult the difficulty of attribution, the absence of drawings and similar records also makes it difficult to establish how these architects developed their designs. Here we have to depend on the few cases where preliminary designs were published or where drawings do survive, and then we have tried to place these architects and their work within the context of the time and the city. So, you know, what is this saying is that right off the bat, um, the historical narrative is based on boosterism by newspapers. So, so let's proceed with that in mind. Um, and I'm going to do, again, a deeper dive into this book, uh, into the work of H. H. Richardson in within Seattle and around the country. Now, uh, <clears throat> I believe that it's appropriate to begin uh, to look at Seattle's history, attributing homage to the namesake of the city, Chief Seattle, uh, and this is said to be the only photograph of him. It's said that he was befriended by the sort of founding fathers of Seattle, uh, characters like uh, Henry Yesler and Doc Maynard. I read over and over again that Doc Maynard befriended Seattle. Uh, what it seems to me is that he was sort of an, um, an accommodationist. He didn't fight the settlers. Uh, in the 1850s, there was what they call the, uh, the Indian Wars in the Northwest here. Apparently it was raging in, the, in Yakima, which is more you know, central Washington. Uh, Seattle had a, a skirmish or two. Nothing major in the city uh, itself, but that I suppose is largely because um, Chief Seattle here, he accommodated, he accommodated the uh, influx of, of white settlers. And for that, he was allowed to live, I think, um, simply put, and his people were allowed to live on, albeit, um, you know, on a reservation as the Port Madison Indian Reservation across Puget Sound from Seattle. Uh, there's a town called Suquamish, um, which is the tribal headquarters. There's another town called Indianola, which is also on the Port Madison Indian Reservation. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, Native Americans or Suquamish folks there. There's a few. Uh, 
uh, so I did live in Indianola for, for a little while, so I'm somewhat familiar with this history. Um, this is not going to be the focus of this particular podcast. I'm not so sure that this is my story to tell, but I did want to frame uh, the history of Seattle with its namesake. There's one piece of um, history that I'd like to share regarding Chief, Chief Seattle, and I think that it um, it is going to sort of help to contextualize uh, Seattle as it has developed over really the last 150 years. Um, so from one of the books I read, when residents of uh, the fast growing settlement on Elliott Bay, uh, which is here in the Puget Sound, were certain, which is also, by the way, uh, the Salish Sea. So the Salish Indians uh, uh, lived up and around, various tribes lived up and around uh, the Salish Sea, which goes, which goes all the way up into uh, Canada, uh, Vancouver Island, and all the way down to uh, like, uh, let's say Tacoma. Uh, so it's a fairly large region of, of Salish um, tribes. They were searching for a name for their new town, something distinctive that would set it apart from other prospect, prospering villages on Puget Sound. Doc Maynard, um, who again was one of the founding fathers, Doc Maynard, uh, from what I read, owned a whole lot of land in what became downtown Seattle at the time. This is 1850. When they arrived, old growth forest. Um, Doc Maynard supposedly urged them to honor the chief and the local Indians. However, upon hearing that the town was to be given his name, Chief Seattle felt uneasy since the Salish tribes believed that having their names spoken after death would disturb the spirits of the departed. It is said that he used this name, borrow, this name borrowing as grounds for levying a tax upon local citizens, receiving payment now for what he saw as later unrest of his soul. Um, so I, you know, I read that and I had to pause and I, I want to read this again. Um, upon hearing that the town was to be given his name, Chief Seattle felt uneasy since the Salish tribes believed that having their name spoken after death would disturb the spirits of the departed. Uh, you know, again, the more I learn about Seattle, the more I research its past, the more sort of disturbing it really is. So um, it, it makes me wonder if this is really truly a city of disturbed spirits. Now, upon his death in 1866, uh, he was buried uh, after both Catholic and Salish ceremonies. Now, now Chief Seattle was uh, apparently converted to Catholicism by French missionaries uh, in the earlier part of the 1800. His Christian, the Christian name that he was given was Noah. So I thought that was interesting. You know, speaking of uh, reset civilizations. Um, but it was not until 24 years later did his white friends in the city, uh, the, uh, named for him, decide to erect an appropriate marker over his grave, uh, which is now in the town of Suquamish. So he died in 1866. Uh, he lived in, he, he, he uh, rested, his body rested in a pauper's grave, essentially, unmarked for 24 years um, until they finally uh, decided to erect an appropriate marker over his grave. So, um, you know, what kind of friends are those would be my first question. But then when I do the math, um, 24 four years after 1866 is 1890, which is a year after Seattle's Great Fire. Um, now, you know, I just find that interesting. And I think it's worth sort of pausing and, 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 and um, letting that wash over you. Now, Seattle, uh, Chief Seattle had a daughter, um, the name that's attributed to her is Princess Angeline. Again, this is not going to be the primary focus of this podcast, but I, I do, this, this really does help contextualize Seattle's, Seattle's deep history. The most popular native, native subject by far was a beautifully lined face of Chief Seattle's daughter, Princess Angeline. So, tourists... Basically, tourists would come to town, uh, they'd buy a postcard uh, to remember their time in Seattle with uh, you know, the, the image of the daughter of Chief Seattle, uh, who, could, who could be seen uh, shucking oysters in this cottage uh, that was built 
by you know some downtown by the wharfs you know granted this is the year 2023 and looking in hindsight and all of that but um none of this sits well with me and um you know i question this uh, idea of uh, the friendship of um, seattle's founding fathers with these with these folks so and again i mentioned doc maynard held a lot of land um, in what is now downtown seattle uh, a, lo a lot of the old growth trees were felled and fed through uh, henry Yesler's mill uh, it was the first steam powered um, mill that was set up in what became seattle's downtown and um, it chewed up a lot of ancient trees and made a lot of boards and made a lot of sawdust um, the sawdust is going to be the subject of future part of this podcast and because it said that the sawdust was used to fill in the tidal flats uh, down by the duwamish river these are big trees it's a lot of sawdust and um Henry Yesler's mill must have been uh, particularly busy for, for decades. It was said that it burned down uh, several times and it was rebuilt um, once in the 60s, in the 1860s, 1870s. And then again, it was finally torched for good in 1889 with the great, with the, uh, great fire. Um, Henry Yesler's name is going to come up again and again, and he is, of all the characters of this time, is, you know, attributed with being the, the founding father of Seattle. Now, here's our friend. Um, I don't know, kind of looks like a sketchy dude. He was married, and his wife stayed abroad or out of state for around the first decade uh, while he ran his mill. And then he he was um, he had a um, a, li a live-in mistress of a, an Indian girl. It said who gave birth, and when his wife showed up, they had to spirit away the Indian girl and the baby. So this we're in the 1850s now, and this is what's presented to us as Seattle's early days, 1850. Founding fathers arrive, settlers start showing up, but really there's just a few handfuls of people here. And there's, you know, these wooden shacks. Uh, this is said to be Yesler's cookhouse where all of the things happen. Everybody met and everybody ate and people got married and um, memories were made. And this stuck around for a very long time in downtown Seattle as it developed around this ramshackle structure here. This is Denny Hill. Now, if you go back and, and, and look at the last episode, the last deep, deep dive I did in Seattle's history, focusing on the underground, we looked at the, uh, not just the underground Seattle, but the regrade projects that took the uneven landscape, uh, the hills that formally, you know, defined this area and just lopped them down, just flattened them over decades and took all of that sediment and dumped it, dumped it into the, uh, to the tidal flats in the south of downtown and, and um, rerouted the Duwamish River into a shipping channel uh, for mercantile interests um, when it had been a winding river for forever. Um, so, and if you look here where it says First Avenue and this Yesler Way, this is this area here is what is now Pioneer Square. So you think about the enormity of this project um, uh, over the next half century or so, um, really after the next 75 years, because this went into the early part of the uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, what is being shown here now uh, as, as uh, part of the Elliott Bay, um, is now part of downtown Seattle. So 1861, this is the Territorial University. Um, in 1860, the census had 300 people, 303 people living in Seattle. 179 of them were men over the age of 21. So, you know, working, working men, 
people, men that were going out building buildings, building houses, um, you know, farming, cutting down trees, milling trees, um, uh, fishermen, trappers, merchants, so forth. Um, so now with 300 people and a little more than half of them being men of working age, um, this shows up and that's cool. This is a nice building. It can see, you know, using the big wood of the time and old growth material, old growth boards to, to craft this structure. You know, apparently the territory needed a university. So yeah, okay. You know, but just right off the bat, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this fellow down here on a bicycle and maybe he's sitting down, but if he stood up, he might be, let's say he's six feet. Um, you know, so where does that brings him to maybe the first mulling on this window? So if this is a building that needed to be heated at least six months of the year, it gets pretty cold. It doesn't get freezing in Seattle for that long. Um, there's a lot of rain. Cold kind of gets under your skin. But uh, what I'm seeing is a building with 12, 15 foot ceilings, windows that are look to be about 10 foot tall columns. Sure, these are wooden columns, but think of the work it takes to craft, you know, this ionic, um, very, very sculptural ionic um, capital. Um, yeah, you know, these were talented people, old world craftsmen and so forth. But I'm just looking at the scale of this and just I'm scratching my head and I'm saying at this time is, is this really what, uh, is this what was called for? Is this what was needed? And, and um, why so big? Why such tall ceilings? You know, territorial university, okay, they're trying to make a statement, but you know, just leaving a question mark there, if not an asterisk and proceeding. Again, this is what we are shown for Seattle's downtown back in 1870. Now in 1870, census says we have a population of 1,100 people. So this is what you'd expect, you know, it's Deadwood. Here we are, there's a grocery, there's a hardware store. Um, it's a nice building, some ornamentation on there, yeah, but it's what you would expect. For in the downtown, looking up Front Street, what became First Avenue. And so this uh, bird's eye view of the city of Seattle is from 1878. Now this, was drawn by Eli S. Glover. And Eli S. Glover went around the country doing a lot of these drawings. Here's the city of Olympia. Uh, here's the city of Port Townsend. And what I find interesting about these maps is that they're official documentation. It's sort of a survey of the existing conditions of the city. Uh, that entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1878 by E.S. Glover in the office of the Librarian of Congress. Uh, this E.S. Glover, I've seen maps like this of Denver, of various cities, and um, they're interesting um, because it shows in 1878 there was a railroad of sorts coming into Seattle. Make note of that and we'll return to that. There was, you know, these are kind of you know, just sketch buildings. It's it's an overall survey. We're not expecting, you know, high art in this. And in fact, uh, we looked at Denny Hill before and um, the source I read makes mention of the fact that he kind of flattened out the Denny Hill for perspective is how it was, is how it was put. For perspective, he just made it into a flat land. Here's our, what looks to be our uh, territory university building right here. But other than that, 1978, not much of note, you know, a church here and there. Um, so let's proceed, you know, and then again, this, the story here is that there's not much to see here. Um, and, and it's not much that really stands out as far as notable architecture in 1878. And these, these dates are important, right? And, but we do have a railroad coming through. But then I come across this, Providence Hospital, 1878. 3,000 people living in the city is a lot of, a lot of patients and, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of materials, 
Um, you know, and you got to get your resources from somewhere. So in the last picture we saw in the bird's eye view of Seattle by E.S. Glover, we saw a railroad coming in. But in 1878, uh, the railroad that we were shown in that picture was not connected to the interstate um, national railroad system. That railroad system went as far as it's called the, uh, the Seattle and Walla Walla Railroad. Uh, Walla Walla is a, a town south of here. Um, that was also a very important town at the time, uh, uh, but but it didn't it didn't it didn't go as far as Tacoma. It didn't connect to um, the interstate railroad system. So Seattle was, you know, it was um, it wasn't landlocked, but anything coming in would have had to come in by by sea as far as materials um, or overland with horse and buggy. And there's, you know, so the railroad system didn't come online in Seattle till much later, and and we'll get into that. And this building, the history books attribute the architecture. Uh, the design and the execution to Mother Joseph, the builder. So Providence Hospital, this building, was designed and executed by Mother Joseph, the builder. And this is what the narrative tells us. Very, very talented lady. Here's another view, 1878. Well, this particular photo is actually from 1884. Um because this shows up. This is Central High School, 1884. In 1884, there may have been, might have been about 15,000 people living in the city. Um, now I'm really starting to scratch my head because again, here we are, 1879, and this looks like what you would expect for a settlement town. Um, and these are the types of buildings that you would expect would be built by a developing town whose primary resource is old growth timber. Not so much this or this, but this. So it's like already, you know, we're very early on in this presentation and it's almost like two different built realities are beginning to emerge. 1880s, this photograph was attributed. And again, when I present dates, these are dates that were that were in the books. I'm just, you know, that's the date that was presented. So that's the order in which I um, inserted them into this uh, presentation. This is said to have been from the 1880s. Lo and behold, 1881, the post building appears. The post building. Now, this is beautiful, but this is stone. Said to have been built in 1881 was the headquarters of the Seattle Post Intelligentsia. It's a now defunct newspaper. It existed as a print newspaper when I moved to Seattle in 2004, and it's since shuttered. It's now online as an emaciated uh, um, web news portal, mostly stupid ads. It's kind of sad. Um, now Seattle Times is the, news, is the news, newspaper of record in Seattle. Um, and but the Seattle PI has a quite a storied legacy. Uh, it was owned by none, none other than uh, Henry Yesler. Uh, and Yesler, incidentally, also invested in railroads, uh, streetcars, real estate, and steamerships. But lo and behold, the headquarters of uh, his newspaper, the Seattle PI, uh, appears at, in stone and brick in, or, in ornate detail and again with incredibly high ceilings that would have to be you know would make really large interiors that would have to be heated and curiously enough um, this interesting underground uh, level walking down from the street front which is an odd way to build in a city that rains um, six months out of the year at a minimum so this is the railroad that we saw in the in the Glover uh, bird's eye. Now I've seen this same picture show up in two different places. Uh, one attributing it to 1882, um, and one attributing it to 1884-85. And that the difference of those years is important because in 82, in the earlier iteration, this railroad 
was our Seattle and Walla Walla Railroad. It's a narrow gauge track. Basically, it never even made it to Walla Walla. It got as far as uh, Renton, which is, you know, south of Seattle, and was bringing coal. Basically, its job was to bring coal from Renton to, you know, probably Yesler's steam-powered mill and other industries. Now, this railroad here came later in 1884, uh, and this is the Puget Sound Shore Railroad. Why this is important is because this ultimately tied us into, into uh, Tacoma. And Tacoma, Tacoma was brought into the Transcontinental Railroad early on in the uh, well, early 1870s. Tacoma was chosen as the termination point for, for the Transcontinental Railroad. And that put a lot of Seattle uh, businesses out of business because they would develop their businesses in anticipation of the, inter of the Transcontinental Railroad reaching Seattle. When that didn't happen, it was another decade before a link to Tacoma was, was in the works. Um, but in fact, it was, while it was, this was, excuse me, built in 1984, it, it ran into financial difficulties and it never became operational or it was for a few months. And then it just basically got abandoned and fell into disrepair. And then it was never fully online again until 1889, the year of the Great Fire. So uh, suffice to say, Seattle was not connected to the transcontinental railroad system until, realistically speaking, until the late 1880s. This is vitally important because here again, the buildings that we have seen already and that we're about to see require an enormous amount of material resources being brought in. And what when I started looking into this, I figured, well, at least, you know, at least they had the railroad. At least we could, you know, look at the fact that the railroad was there to bring materials, to bring the glass, to bring the, the metals, to bring, you know, the steel, to bring the bricks and the stone in, but not so much. All of it would have had to have come by you know, horse, cart, and by boat, 1882. This is the Yesler Leary building. Once again, Henry Yesler's name attributed to uh, an important uh, uh, slice of Seattle's history. This building was in what is now Pioneer Square, uh, was called Occidental Square for some time. Um, this is 1882. And honestly, when I first saw this building, I almost fell out of my chair. At this early period, by 1882, there may have been, again, 10,000, 15,000 people at most. And, and again, if you think half of those are men of working age, you know, we're down to five to, five to 8,000 workers. And then out of that, how many are lumberjacks? How many are millers? How many are building the residential houses made out of this wood? Uh, how many are farmers, fishermen, trappers, merchants, so forth and so forth and so forth. And then out of those that are left, how many are master masons? You know, we when we when I have these conversations with people, um, what's often you know the rejoinder that's often you know put on the table as well. They knew how to build things back then, and yes, they did know how to build things back then. Yeah, there was master craftsmen that were coming from Europe as immigrants. I get that. But you got to have enough of them and you got to have enough resources to work with. And you got to have enough time. This is in 1882. Why so big? I just have to ask this question again and again. How are these being heated? It gets cold here. <laughs> I hope I don't sound like a broken record, but I think a lot of these points bear repeating. This is ornate craftsmanship, broken arches. I mean, columns, capitals, bases, everywhere. The detail on this building is exquisite. The amount of time it would have taken to do this, the amount of resources that it would have taken to do this, the amount of labor power, and the architecture is just magnificent. So I was challenged by somebody who left a comment in my last video on Seattle Underground and she took issue with the fact that I used the term old world to describe 
to qualify architecture in Seattle, some architecture. Uh, she said, basically, my, my, my terminology is twisted and, and don't you know the old world is in the East and the new, the new world is in the West? Well, you know, here's my response. What else do I call this? This is an old world building, if I've ever seen one. And what is this top made out of? Is this, is this, this roof here, is this metal? It sure looks like it. It looks riveted. So this kind of building just absolutely takes my breath away. And here it shows up in 1882, according to the official record, on what was just previously, and you saw the drawing only a, maybe a couple of short decades ago, was tidal flats, was an extension of the bay. This is why I pointed that out at first in Yesler was, you know, <laughs> according to, to that drawing, you know, was a little island in the middle of the bay. And now here we are with this building. Now, and it's not just that building, it's this one, it's this one. It keeps going. Look at these ones. These are all stone, stone and brick and ornate, every one of them. I mean, this looks like it could have been, I don't know, Paris, New Orleans, and horses and buggies, and then sidewalks that are just all janky. I should say streets that are janky and, you know, sidewalks that are, it looks like wood, but I can't tell for sure. Uh, so this is where I really start to part ways with what's being presented to us as the, as the history of, of Seattle. Here is another view. I like this one because the resolution is, is really crisp and you can see, I mean, these are angels carved up here. This kind of curved French mansard type roof, this must have been metal. And uh, please remember this building because according to history, otherwise known as boosterism, this lived for all of seven years and was disappeared in the 1889 fire. Does this look like a building that is seen less than seven years when this photograph was taken? Or does this look, this look like a building that has been around for a very long time? This doesn't look like a few years old to me. And what is this up here? A weather vane telling us which way the wind blows. Well, now, again, 1882, here's the Yesler Leary building. And what do we have here? You know, that row of ornate brick and stone buildings went down that street, but here we've got a whole nother block. And this is this is the Occidental building, okay? And I'm gonna ask you to remember this one as well, because the Occidental building was also disappeared in the Great Fire. And when I say disappeared, I mean, poof, gone by a fire. And this is a stone building. And what we have is a horse-drawn streetcar. And that's what the, story, the storybooks, the history books tell us is that at this time in 1882, Seattle had a horse-drawn trolley system, okay? That's a lot of infrastructure to put in just to pull some people around by horse, but I guess that's what you do. This beautiful mansion became the home of our friend Henry Esler, because when his wife showed up and he disappeared his... Indian girl mistress and her baby um, relocated, let's say. Uh, he went from living in, you know, downtown ramshackle cookhouse to, to a mansion, you know, proper for a founder of Seattle. And incidentally, he, he was mayor twice, once in 1884, um, just before the uh, Seattle fire. And so this building became after his death in 1892, uh, went on to house the Seattle Public Library, and then wouldn't you know it, uh, poof, up it went in smoke uh, by 1900 and was gone. Now, this, <laughs> what's in the background here? This is the um, King County Courthouse, and we're gonna come around to that. Now, these kinds of buildings just keep showing up. All right, we're going to come back to this. So just, you know, put a bookmark there. Not to be outdone, we have Fry's Opera House. Now, here again, this is a drawing. 
remember boosterism. So this probably would have appeared in a newspaper of the time and been sent out a, around the country to promote, you know, promote Seattle as a, a destination city. But here in the early 1800s, um, with our population hovering around 12 to 15,000 people, this is a lot of beautiful, exquisite, uh, ornate stone brick buildings with m all sorts of metallurgy. Remember folks, the railroad still isn't even here yet. You know, the coal railroad is, but not the, not the transcontinental railroad. So where are we getting all our stuff? Where are we getting all our materials? How are we building all of this with so few people in so little time? Now, speaking of boosters, and so this is interesting. Uh, this is the same building, the Fry Opera House. You can see there's little discrepancies in how the artists portrayed, you know, this or that portico. But, you know, generally speaking, they were true to it, except that on this one, we're missing our top. What happened to this? Now, that's not something that you just kind of etch a sketch out of the picture because this is you know this is kind of cool it's part of the composition so where'd the tower go and why'd they take it down if this was just built well this drawing isn't that old they built that and then they just lopped off the top so okay taking note and here we have a streetcar again oh but on this streetcar there's no horse there's no horse pulling this one this one is just kind of moving on its own so what is that about was it just horse-drawn trolleys? Or did Seattle have some other kind of infrastructure at that very early time in its history? This again is 1884. In 1884, we also had Holy Names Church, a very prominent building, which looks to me like brick, beautiful, a little overwrought architecturally, you know, kind of busy, but very impressive. And what's with this, what's with this staircase that just goes up and up in the entrance on the second floor? Sort of odd, architecturally speaking, but what's going on up top is, that's pretty impressive. Built in 1884, lasted a couple of decades and was disappeared by the regrade projects. Right down here, we get another little sneak peek preview of the King County Courthouse. I apologize if some of these images are out of order. I've got over 110 of them in here, maybe 120. Um, I did my best to to collate this in a way that makes sense. So you know, some of them, you know, we'll just we'll just uh, look at at them as they appear in the order um, that they're presented. This is the Occidental Hotel. You know, we looked at that earlier. It's right across the uh, street from kind of kitty corner from the Yesler building. Again, here we are, 1984. What's going on up here? What is going on? This is stone. Look at these details, the attention to detail, the time. And I'm sorry, but this is not the kind of building you just throw up in a year or two or even. And one of the things when we talk about attribution, of, <laughs> look at this person just creepily peeking through the dark window, my goodness. When we talk about attributing, you know, time and resources and, 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 you know, who built what and when and who is the architect, one of the things that almost never comes up and I never really hear about it is who engineered it. Because you don't just design this on a, you know, on a back of an envelope and send it to the contractor and his old world craftsmen, you know, immigrants that just got off the boat from Europe and made it to Seattle. Um, in a covered wagon, just throwing all this together, this this stuff has to be engineered. And then foundations have to be put in, right? And all of this takes time. All of it, each piece of it takes time. And speaking of foundations being put in, here we have again, these very strange windows down at the street grade. And um, I don't know why you would do that. I understand that you'd want to get light into a basement, but if you're designing this from scratch, with all of the attention, the, to the exquisite attention to detail being put in, um, you probably wouldn't want water just kind of flowing in off of the sidewalk into your, into your basement level. One more view for posterity 
of the Occidental Hotel. Now here, I find this interesting. You know, this is again, one of these boosters and uh, artists renderings um, to send to newspapers. But in this image, what we're being shown is a level grade. Windows down at the, <laughs> these strange windows down at the street, at the sidewalk. But this is fairly level. And then when we look back on the old one, this looks like a street, a hill going up and up, doesn't it? So whatever was going on down here, as shown in that picture, if that picture is to be believed, would have been covered by this, by this slope. So, you know, again, you know, put a bookmark, if not an asterisk, asterisk, a lot of detail, a lot of ornamentation, and a lot of, these are interesting, these sort of, they look like chimneys. Um, so is that an answer to the question, like how was this heated? Was this just stuffed with fireplaces? Or maybe it had some kind of a convection radiant type uh, heating system. I love these panoramic collages uh, because there's, there's so much information in them. I really have to take my time going through them. Uh, so this is 1887 panorama from First Hill, looking at our fair city. And again, what do we see? Not too much, 1887, not too much standing out. A few churches, there's hints here and there that there might be something of grandeur. Uh, this is the cent uh, a central high school. Um, what we'll come to find out is that, in fact, if we look down here at this image from this panorama from 1889, there was two central high schools. There was this one, but then there was this one. And that's the one we saw earlier, peeking into the image. Now, what is going on with this building? I ask, here it is uh, in the 50s, before it was destroyed, tower removed. Now, why do they keep taking the towers off? Not just one, but two towers. Were they both removed? And of course, sadly, lamentably, this is where it stood. This is Interstate 5 going through downtown Seattle. But as recently as the 50s, you would have had a residential neighborhood and generations of children going to this absolutely marvelous old world building. Now here's Providence Hospital. If you recall, Mother Joseph, the builder, architected this one and contracted it, reportedly. But just as we have two central high schools, we have two, uh, two Providence hospitals, because that's what you do. There's just a lot of people getting hurt building all these buildings in such a short amount of time. It's stressful. This is from 1888 with the Territory University in the background. You remember that one from earlier? With the giant columns built in 1861 when there was like 12 people in Seattle? I'm kidding, of course, but sometimes you gotta take this with humor. Moving forward, here's another look, 1887. Now in 1887, census says that there's 27,000 people in town. Okay, 27,000 people ornate brick and stone buildings all over, all over the place, and just crappy roads because people that build ornate buildings just give up when they get to the road. Screw it, right? Let's just walk around in the muck and the mire, get our wagon wheels and stuck. Just, you know, wear high boots to walk in the, in the horse manure. Doesn't make sense. What also doesn't make sense is that Whenever I read about Seattle Fire, what I come what I come across is that this was a city of wood buildings, and they were pre then were presented those um, those early iteration, you know, where it looked like dead wood in the earliest period. You got to scratch the surface a little bit to find these photographs. They're not impossible to find. You got just got to look for them. You got to know to look for them, I guess. We got to be that in interested enough to look for them. But the narrative, just like in the Chicago fire, you know, this was before fire codes. This was, they were all, you know, wood shacks, wood, 
shanties and wood buildings that were just jammed up against each other, you know, like a Hollywood movie set or something. But over and over and over again, what I'm seeing is a city of brick and stone. Here it is again, 1888, ornate brick, ornate stone buildings. Beautiful, right? And yeah, there's wood buildings. I'm not saying there's not. What I am saying is there's a huge disconnect between this and this. It's almost as if this was already here and a bunch of settlers showed up and started building this. That's what it seems like to me. 1888, safe deposit, merchant bank building, seven stories. Look at the size of this person here. Look at the scale of these. These are Corinthian columns. Could be granite, probably granite. Look at the size of these stones making up this archway. This is heavy stuff to be pulling in on barge by covered wagon or you know, carted by a horse and buggy, extremely tall ceilings, extremely ornate decorative stonework, extremely time-consuming construction, no detail was spared. And look at this over here, my goodness. Who took the time to chisel all this stuff out? Or is somebody gonna tell, them, tell me that these are molds? Well, that's fine if these are cast, you still got to make a mold in order to cast this stuff. So either way, whether this was chiseled out or whether it was cast cement, it's extraordinary. And then this stupid sign, safe deposit, that they just plunk into the top here like it was part of the original design. I, you know, whenever I see these signs or dates like this kind of stuff, I don't, I don't think those were there. Initially, I think those are telling a story. 1888, seven story, maybe eight story skyscraper. <laughs> it's not quite a skyscraper, but we're starting to get up there. You know, folks, it's, this is a tall building. This would have to be engineered carefully. Every bit of it designed thoughtfully and executed. 1889, the Arlington Hotel. When I read about this, it, it said this was the largest all wood hotel in the territories at the time. And um, it's hard to tell from this photo, but kind of looks like brick, but I can't be sure completely. But it sure is beautiful and it sure is ornate. And there still sure weren't a lot of people around. Um, you know, this is still a very early time. By 1880, um, let's see, 1887, there was 27,000 people. 1890, there was 40,000 people. How many of those were Master Masons? Is it possible? You know, we're gonna have, you're going to have to make up your own mind. I question it. I absolutely question it. I question the time period that these buildings are said to have been built in. And again, what are we basing this history on? What are we basing these timelines on? On boosterism, on newspaper accounts. Newspapers owned by people like Henry Yesler and William Randolph Hearst, and he'll come up again in this in this slideshow, telling us stories, making us believe something. Why? Why do we have? Why? Why would we believe them? That's my question. Why would we? Why would we? Why would we believe the stories that they've given to us about who we are and where we came from? Now, First United Methodist Church is said to have been built in 1889 the year of the Great Fire. And <clears throat> one thing I find curious about churches, uh, sacred buildings, uh, as well as universities, incidentally, is that they never, they often don't make it into the determination of the who, what, and when, and how of city development. They're just kind of over there. They're mysterious. You know, it's like there's other forces at play. And, um, you know, while we focus on the history of cities, the history of urban development, um, but here it is and here, and, and it's, and it's, and it's marvelous. I mean, this, it's like a miniature cathedral. I would have loved to have been in this building and seen it from the inside, little rose window, 
giant doors. Why so big? That door looks like it must be 15 feet tall. Again, why so big? Why so tall? Yeah, the glory of God. I understand that. But really? Because you're letting in a lot of cold air when every time you open that. So, you know, at some point you do have to <laughs> you have to address, you know, practicalities. I and I, I just I see this building and I I marvel at it. Miniature cathedral built in 1889 in Seattle. And what's going on up here? What is this looks like a bejeweled antenna. Is that pulling ether, etheric energy out of the atmosphere? bringing it down connecting a circuit between heaven and earth as above so below certainly seems like it fortunately this building escaped the great fire it was began in the year of the fire but wasn't in the path of the fire unfortunately it didn't escape the regrade projects so the congregation moved to another building and this was raised to the ground because there was greater forces at work greater earthly forces and by greater i mean malicious forces with malice that would just knock something like this down it made it all the way to i think in 1907 before it was regraded so this building was all of 17 18 years old and like the yesler lear building and the occidental building i have a hard time believing that this building was only a few years old when this photo was taken. A really hard time because this looks like, to me, old world architecture. Now, Central High School. Remember those blurry images from earlier and those cartoonish kind of sketches? This is Seattle Central High School of the, at that time. 1889, when people weren't busy building cathedrals, and putting in trolley lines, building Providence Hospital twice. We haven't even gotten to Denny Hotel yet, building railroad systems, cutting down old growth forests, feeding their family, tending to their farms, fishing in the Puget Sound, running their stores. When they weren't busy building, doing all of that work, I guess this is what they were building in 1889. <laughs> It's breathtaking. I guess we just call it a style and move on. Richardsonian Romanesque. So there, we named it. It made it to the 1950s. Now there's a highway, interstate highway. And the souls of the departed remain disturbed in Seattle. And why did they take the tower off this? If you remember the photo from the 1950s, right before it was demolished, there was no tower, tower removed. What's going on here? Is this a, a bell? Some kind of timekeeping mechanism? Are these more of those etheric antennas firing up radiant fireplaces full of antiquitech? I love that term. More strange chimneys. Was it smoke pouring out of here? I don't see soot. I don't see soot on this chimney. This looks like some kind of a, a venting system was this natural <laughs> was this air conditioned i've i've i remember studying um frank Lloyd wright buildings that were air conditioned naturally or through convection currents is that what this was now this building is attributed to the architect named boone and boone like richardson is um said to have built many 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 buildings in seattle in this era, um, many exquisite, many of the exquisite buildings of, of this time were attributed to this architect. Boy, was he busy because every detail is considered. And I'm not saying that we don't have the skills. I'm saying that we do. I'm saying we don't have the time and I'm saying we don't have the resources. And by we, I mean the people that were there at the time. And in 1889, I'll just say it one more time, why such tall ceilings and all of this volume in here to heat a cold climate? Why all these attics upon attics? And I know 
for a fact that these aren't just empty spaces up here. You know, there's things going on up in these in these in these roof structures. I'd give anything to have been able to walk up there and see or just go up into this tower before they took it down. Why would you go through the trouble of removing this? And we'll see that again. We'll see it again and again. These buildings, towers removed. Why? You just built this masterful piece of architecture and then you just cut its head off. Did it offend somebody? There's our booster. Kind of diminishes it. But hey, at least they were trying to tell the world that this existed way out here in the Northwest in Seattle. They used to tell me I was building a dream. 